Okay, let's uh, let's talk about Jamie. So <clears throat> the Jamie chapter came out of this idea that once looking at the timeline on when things happen, we sort of realized that uh, a lot of time, like in the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons, um, we hear that Jamie has been missing for some time. And so... <clears throat> Um, because I was focusing a lot of these chapters on what happened before the first day of winter and what happened after, I knew that we needed one, a Jamie, um, chapter that sort of explained what he was doing in the meantime, um, from the first day of winter. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there, there, there's some various things that that work well with with having a Jamie chapter early. We in in the, in our chapters we sort of begin with a with a Hota, Elaine, and Ariane chapter, and then we go to pretty quickly another Hota, Ariane, Elaine chapter, and we just kind of put the Daenerys chapter in between them. Um, but you know, so having one more there would be would be useful to create some space. Um, so you know, I think originally in my my, my had I had this idea that we'd begin with Jamie, you know, in Stoneheart's lair or something like that. But because there was so much time, you know, weeks we're talking about that need to be accounted for, it's a little weird. It's a little weird that Stoneheart would catch Jamie and put him and just put him in prison for three weeks and then have the action, you know, and do nothing for 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 weeks. So we kind of needed something. We needed something. Um, and so I knew there was just there was going to be a Jamie chapter, a Jamie chapter that involved wandering, uh, that that would explain the lost time. Um, and so here we are. I mean, a lot of there there is some criticism of this chapter. I mean, a lot of people really like the chapter, but I did read some criticism where they feel like, oh, not much happens. Well, yeah, this it's kind of by design. Like we know what's going to happen. We don't want to jump right into the confrontation with Stoneheart, we need some sort of build up and lead up to it. Um, but also we needed to account for what was Jamie doing for weeks. <laughs> um, and so this is where this chapter comes from. Now, because it's a chapter where, yes, admittedly, the plot doesn't move forward that much. Um, there was a lot of other things that we decided to do in here. Um, thematically, like what the Jamie story means, what A Song of Ice and Fire means, uh, so re some repair of Jamie that uh, we kind of felt that um, George, you know, was was a little lacking in that kind of thing. So here we are with Jamie, um, filling time, yes, but explaining where he's been for weeks um, in order to catch him up to the rest of the story. So Jamie. <clears throat> There it was somehow, come to life again, uh, come again to life. Um, in case you're not getting the the reference here, obviously this is, we're talking one in a literal sense about the Inn of the Kneeling Man, but it's, of course, you're supposed to be thinking about whites coming back to life here. Um, you know, there it was somehow, come, to, some, come again to life. Or Lady Stoneheart. <clears throat> and that comes in next here. So... <clears throat> the end of the kneeling man. The whitewash was fresh on its upper floors, pale against dark smoke from the chimney. Um, in the final Brienne chapter of A Feast for... Uh, uh, the, 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 the second to last, when she goes to the in at the crossroads, I sort of read that her description of the inn was a description of Lady Stoneheart. It's kind of... If you go back... Um, there's there's a little bit of that. Um, maybe I'm imagining it, but when you when you look at the inn itself, it kind of feels like it's it's Stoneheart because you, she 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 enters all of these like you know the the hanged bodies around, which obviously Stoneheart did, and then the idea is that the the inn itself is an embodiment of Stoneheart. So here again, the inn is kind of an embodiment of Stoneheart. So the whitewash is fresh, so pale, you know, on its upper floors, a pale face. Pale against the dark smoke from the chimney. This idea that, you know, maybe she has a, a dark cloak of some sort. Light glimmered <clears throat> against two front windows, her eyes looking out. You know, but um, the, the the silty yard, the color of old milk. The silt is, is coming from the floods. The floods are going to bring, 
bring felt silt in but we wanted again like this pale kind of idea of of a white kind of idea a dead old milk you know that curdled kind of uh um color i mean i think sometimes they there there's descriptions of of some sickly or dead people that have a color of old milk um the description there uh the yard was scarred with tracks just like lady stoneheart's neck and face she's scarred um and the men who made them were still about this is the idea that she's you know surrounded by men things aren't perfect here i mean her 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 men didn't do this to her but but here we are the men are going coming and going from the, the stables the latrine and a small hastily erected sept this is the first clue that that the poor fellows have kind of taken over here and then in the middle of it all there knelt a girl um and we we if you kind of figure out this is weasel but she doesn't really have any place in the story she's just there um it's the right place for a stark obviously Torin knelt at the at the end of the kneeling man so weasel is kneeling in the same place that Torin did <clears throat> jamie lannister mused thinking of old Torin, the right place but mayhaps the wrong age isn't she that was obvious of course he doubted the girl had seen her fourth name day Though she seemed to have an appetite beyond her years, she was scarcely finished shoveling a fistful of mud into her mouth before the sight of two riders sent her running. The sight of the two riders sent her running. So it's just a uh, wanted to connect in that we're talking about Sansa and the infant kneeling man. He wants some sort of like connection, and and Weasel um, was was that connection. We won't find Lady Sansa here, Brienne said icily. And where will we find her? Do you think? She didn't dignify that with an answer. So <clears throat> getting Jamie's voice is very difficult. He's um because he's not you don't people don't think of Jamie being like and this is a lot to do with the Game of Thrones Game of Thrones portrayal. They don't think of him being that much of a dick, but he is he is a lot of a he is a real dick. And they, they sometimes don't think of him being that intelligent and funny, but he's actually very intelligent and funny. Um and so here, like, you know, Jamie is definitely in full dick mode and he is clever and funny this this uh this entire this entire time. I mean he is, you know, he's he's maybe not Tyrion, but he's he's still Lannister, you know. Um and then we kind of go back, and this is the kind of the big explanation of where Jamie's been. The girl was but a day but a day's ride from Penny Tree. That's what she did say at the end of uh Jamie wanted Dance with Dragons, Brienne had claimed nigh on a fortnight ago. Um and there's no way the girl would be a fortnight from Penny Tree. I mean, a day's ride from Penny Tree. Like, there's no way that the the Brotherhood Without Banners lair would be a day or day's ride from Penny, from Penny Tree. So she was lying then. So we're we're just taking that same lie. Like this was this was a this was very difficult to write because you're because Jamie is following someone who's clearly lying to him, and you have to come up with a justification on like why he would do that, and how uh, how you know how that would work the location of the brotherhood without banners is um unusual it doesn't really make very much sense you know brienne gets captured at the inn at the knee, at the uh, inn at the crossroads and she's somehow brought like you know in a in a fever dream to the uh the hollow hill but how long was she out like even if you're, even if you say something really extreme, like "oh, she was out of it for like three days," that's still not long enough to get to like where where they were with Arya, which is you know closer to Acorn Hall and things like this. So it's it's very difficult to actually uh, figure out the geography and everything. So I, I, I we struggled a bit here because George is contradictory. You know, the, the Hollow Hills just exist somewhere, or maybe there's more than one Hollow Hill, and they they, they move. It's hard to say, but um, the idea is that you know she's wandering, and it becomes as ambiguous as George R. R. Martin has made it. That so, um, so then they'd wandered down frozen gullies, up windswept bluffs, through dense forests dusted with snow. Despite the order to await his return, Jimmy's men would surely uh, uh, were surely following them by now. Ilan Payne wouldn't dare lose another Lannister after, uh, not after being held responsible for Tyrion's escape. That's something from Feast. Um, Ilan Payne, the reason he goes with Jaime is because the Queen's mad at him and he doesn't want to get killed because she blames him for, Tyr for, for Tyrion's escape. 
So Ilan Payne, if he lost, if he lost Jamie too, it's you know it's over for him. Um, his squires would be there too: Lewis Piper, Garrett Page, Jasmine Peckleton. We don't really know what happened to them, but um, like they're not mentioned in Jamie one. In fact, Ilan Payne isn't uh, isn't even mentioned, but um, you know. Maybe they're there. Um, and then Sir Garth Greenfield and Mallow the Dornishman. These were two captives from a Game of Thrones that we said that we decided to, to bring back. These are some some real background characters. Garth Greenfield, I think he might be mentioned in some appendices. Um, but I was like, if we're gonna have Garth Greenfield come back, um, cause I think in the, what's see, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, in the appendice, in the appendix of A Storm of Swords, he is said to be, Garth Greenfield is said to be um, pr prisoned at Raventree Hall. So the idea is that Jamie would free him and then we're going to throw somebody else that was there at the time that Garth was captured, Mallow the Dornishman, who's a random character from, from, uh, uh, a Game of Thrones, though, I think I have big. I think I have big plans for Mallow the Dornishman. Like, why not? But this is why we say they wouldn't abandon a man whom they owed their freedom. And there would be more too, many more knights and huntsmen seeking honor and glory. Um, the idea is that huntsmen would know how to track. <clears throat> uh, and this is our little pun here: knights and huntsmen seeking honor and glory, but honor and glory hadn't been found just yet. Um, we hear a lot more about honor which is Jamie's horse, but glory is another horse in the pack. He, they were given, he was given honor and glory. And so the idea is that if Brienne were riding, you know, on a, on the, well, some old brotherhood horse, she would be given a new horse, but we don't really go into it, but yes, she's riding glory and Jamie's riding honor. So honor and glory have not been found. And just as, you know, Sansa has not been rescued, that sort of thing. As she led the way, Brienne uh, was doing everything in her power to obscure their horses' tracks. They um, they doubled back, rode through streams, and kept upon earth that was as hard was hard and bare of snow. It's just some elements to try to show that you know winter is coming. It was a lonely journey, far from roads or villages. They allowed themselves no fires, save when they sheltered deep within caves, to be so only, seen only by bats and spiders. A little bit, a little bit of um, maybe the Arion, Arion in there. Um, Conversation had been as meager as meals. Um, on the first day, they shared hard sausage. Uh, as they shared hard sausage, he asked how much further they had to go. Um, this is a bit about like, what do they eat? A lot of times people travel in Game of Thrones and you don't think about what they're eating. Sometimes George explains in too much detail what they're eating, but still, you know, how they survive here. Um, so she, there is some hard stuff. They did bring provisions. Brand scowled at him and told him to, to keep quiet lest they be discovered. It was Acorn. Then you can see that the provisions run out. So now they're talking. Now we're, we're talking about surviving off the land. So it was Acorn paste and cattails on the third day because he's only expecting a day's ride, right? So they bring about two days of food and they're out of that food. And so it's Acorn paste and cattails, which um, Acorns and cattails are what you can survive in in a, you know, if you're lost in the woods and what's edible, like acorns and cattails are, are a couple, some of the things. And he asked who splinted their arm. She only shushed him uh, with a flash of anger. But while fording the trident on the seventh day, Brienne happened to spear a fish. And he told her any proper feast ought to have some dancing. And so they danced. Well, this is, you know, to bring in, bring in a little battle here, a little fighting. Um, you know, obviously a bit of a callback to their their last um, battle, which was uh, before they were caught by the brave companions. But also, it's a little bit it's a little bit of um, a callback to Hota um, sparring, having his honesty spar with um, with Balon Swan. But here, there's you know she doesn't Brienne's not too honest, or at least she's not very open. The water's, uh, the water's roar drowned out the sounds of their blades, but Jamie could still hear the clacking laughs in his head each time the wind struck him. Obviously, we're talking about Sir Illin here. Um, 
She was better than Sir Ill and far better, even fighting without a shield. Jimmy never landed a clean blow, yet as their sparring went on, he could see he was in worse pain than he, uh, she was in worse pain than he was. The shield thing, which is going to come back, it comes, yeah, um, you know, I. There was a lot of evolution on this because, like, Jay, like Brienne is really, really hurt. Uh, in a feast for crows, like she, she has a broken arm that's been splinted. That's been splinted, and, um. Every single submission that I got, you know, I think had mention of Dunk of Dunk's shield, and that like, well, we got to talk about Dunk's shield. Dunk's shield, like, Jamie is going to see the Kingsguard shield, and he's going to comment about it. Like, we have to have that conversation. Like, it's impossible that they wouldn't. That's true. But why would she be? But she can't be using the shield if her arm's broken, right? So. She here is fighting without the shield um, because she can't. And then it just, the thought of like riddling out the logic eventually became like the discussion later on. Um, so a lot, a lot of this happened organically. Um, Who gave you your wounds? He asked uh, after a wince she couldn't hide. The hound, she said, sucking in breath from another thrust. Jimmy parried. What did he want? You. And why is that? He lunged, trying to use his quickness. Maddeningly, the, the huge woman was quicker still. The opening was gone almost before he moved. Then lazily, she knocked the blade from his hand. He didn't say. Yeah, and this is, um, again, this is, I think, the problem, the big problem that a lot of the, the writers and editors like wrestled with. What do you do when Jamie is on this like trip with Brienne? Like, why isn't she telling him everything? Why, like, how, why would she be silent? Why would she, like, why would Jamie go along? Why would he be fooled by all of this? It's, it's kind of a ridiculous thing. But we hear in the epilogue that he goes off with Brienne alone. So he does agree to do this. So, you know, you need this explanation. Like, he's going along, but Brienne's not actually telling him everything. Um, maddeningly, the human, um, a broken arm, cracked ribs, and no, no shield. And still, she did not make an effort. Luckily, he had no pride left to lose then. He gathered up his sword, honored his opponent with a deep brow and a grin that was all teeth, trying to make this more Jamie, and sat down on the rock to rest. Not a day, or, and then, you know, this got edited a lot because it's like, he must be asking her about Clegane. Like, wouldn't, like, why would he be walking into a death trap and things like this and like trying to make this all sen make sense? So he says, not, to, night or day, uh, not a day or night he had passed that Jamie hadn't wondered about Sandra Clegane. What did he want in exchange for Lady Sansa? Uh, who who could give it to him? I mean, I guess that there would be that, be that assumption that Sansa is a hostage and that he needs to offer something to her. Um, but then, you know, who could give it to him? Where would he go? And now she says he wants me as a man to bargain with. Perhaps it was that. But what he'd heard of the Hound's crimes that Saltpan disquieted him. Sane men might be keen to dick her, but broken men dealt only in violence. So one of the big themes of the, the chapter is that Jamie is marching to death and feels like he's marching to death, just as all of us are kind of marching to death. Like this is the kind of thing. What do you do? What do you do with your life knowing that you're going to die? Um, and how do you define your life? Which is getting back to Jamie in the white book. This is an important aspect to it all. But, you know, a lot of writer, a lot of writers and editors were like, why would he be marching into his death? Like, why, you know, shouldn't he be, shouldn't he assume that Clegane would want to bargain for something? And, and why? And so this line, like sane men might be keen to dicker, but broken men don't dealt only in violence is like the explanation of that. Like he's, he's initially going off under the pretense that, that this is going to be a bargaining si a situation, but he kind of knows deep down that if the that if the hound is crazy, it's going to lead to a fight, and he knows if it leads to a fight, he's done because he can't fight. Um, so it was, it, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of juggling, and I, and I'm happy how it all came out because I think it, I don't, I don't think you know when you read when you read it, you realize like how much trouble we had like balancing like the motivations of Jamie and Brienne here, but it was really, really difficult. Um, 
and this is you know threads left by George that I have to like having to reconcile. So Brienne says, "You have some advantage," she'd said after seeing the Oathkeeper and with a mocking, uh, returning his mocking bow at the humorless one. Still, her frown had finally lifted. For one, you now fight left-handed. By the way, Brienne has never smiled for Jamie. This is kind of this is mentioned once in in Storm, or that that he'd never seen her smile. So, he, but he sees that her frown is lifted. But now she's saying, "For one, you fight left-handed." Um, so left-handed fighting, George brings up left-handed fighting when Sirio Farrell is teaching Arya to fight, um, and says, "Oh, it's good. You know, people, people, you'll people will be awkward against you." Um, and that's true, but not for anybody that's like a trained fighter. And so, like realistically, like yeah, like people starting out, yeah, left-handers have an advantage, but no, like eventually everybody learns how to fight left-handers. Um, you know, cause it's, there's enough of them that you run into them on, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot. So, so Jamie, it's, it's a bit of a meta joke. Like, oh, you have this advantage. You fight left-handed. And he's like, what, what are you talking about? So she's like, for one, you fight left-handed. And he says, oh, for two, will you tell me that the hound now fights like it's not a squire? Like only a squire. It would be an advantage only if you, you were a squire. Only one man in 10 favored his left. It was true. And it could be awkward to adjust to the sword coming from the other side if you were a green boy. But a thousand duels later, the, that boy would be transformed, the weakness overcome. Any knight of worth could fend off a left-handed swordsman well enough. Sandor Clegane was more than that and had sparred with left-handed Boris Blount a hundred times besides. Nor had it gone too well for the white knight on those occasions. Spare me your consolation. If you're leading me to battle, if you're, you're leading me to market. Now, the left-handed thing is going to come back. Um, because the idea he's saying any knight of worth, uh, can fight anyone left-handed. Okay, but we're talking about the Brotherhood, and he's gonna have you know Jamie's probably gonna have a trial by combat with the Brotherhood, and so the idea is is that yeah they're knights of the Hollow Hill, but they're all not real knights, are they? And they're all not really practiced, so. This idea may be coming back about Jamie's one advantage in this situation is that he's left-handed. Well, not really left-handed, but he's fighting left-handed. But this is this is, I mean, I might be spoiling spoiling Jamie too, but I mean, years down the line. But uh, maybe not years, but year year down the line when we get to Jamie too. Um yes, this might this might come back into things. Like, who is Jamie fighting? Will they be an experienced knight? Will they know how to fight against a left-hander? Uh, if you're leading me to bat battle, you're leading me to market. When you when you take an animal to market, when you lead an animal to market, you you take it to butcher. Like that's the that's the phrase here. That you know, like this little piggy went to market. Well, the piggy is going to market to be butchered. Um, so if you're leading me to battle, you're leading me to market. Yet there'd been no butchering thus far, only an open road and a rebuilt inn. It's puzzling that they were here at all. Brienne had spent so many days evading Jimmy's bend, only to reveal herself for all to see. Hooded and bearded, Jamie himself uh, looked no different from other men, and his golden, with his golden hand concealed in Brienne's bag. Even his stump looked ordinary in the battle-ravaged riverlands. Uh, there was a lot of discussion here, by the way, on like where people hide their stuff and where people keep their stuff. J uh, George, for the most part, keeps it ambiguous. Like he talks about people having bags and sandal saddlebags. A lot of times people put a lot of stuff in their saddlebags, but their saddlebags are, you know, they're really hard. They're really big and they're hard to get off a horse. You wouldn't just like take a saddlebag with you. So the question is, who's guarding your stuff? How do you keep your stuff safe? Um, and George just kind of never doesn't address any of that issue, you know? Like, how do you keep your stuff safe? Like, when you stay at an inn and you've got a bunch of valuables in your saddlebag, do you drag the whole saddlebag, like, and all of your stuff into the into the inn, into the room? Um, do you pay someone in the stables to keep your stuff safe? It's never addressed, so, you know, but at the same time, it just wouldn't, like you wouldn't leave that golden hand. So we just kind of have golden hand in the bag, in Brand's bag. Um, 
but yeah even even in a storm of swords like jamie with the big with the beard and everything he wasn't he didn't feel like he could be recognized but of course brienne is different where your maid cannot escape notice with her six foot frame bandaged face heavy mail um tales of visit of her would spread like wildfire felt this like this little metaphor this little you know jamie has a history there with the wildfire why then have those wounds sapped her spirit so that she's finally beyond caring they dismounted at the stables um handed their reins to the stable boy then trudged across the yard jamie found himself remembering the last uh time the two had been here by the way the logistics of so much time on the logistics of like how do you check into an inn and like you know do you do you want to waste time like talking about them dis- dismounting horses and dealing so it's just you know you try to make things economical but at the same time like logical jimmy found himself remembering the last time the two had been here there'd been an innkeeper wasn't an innkeep a trap that hadn't that hadn't trapped them too much horse horse shit in the stables this was from you know jamie three a storm of swords the horse shit is because the brotherhood was always there back and forth the innkeeper was who was an innkeeper was in league with them <clears throat> uh, so was his wife sharna uh husband is the 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 innkeeper who wasn't an innkeeper is called, he's known as husband um and the trap he sends them he sends them off to go into a trap of of the brotherhood but they take a different road and then Jamie thinks, oh, is Brienne thrown in with outlaws? Well, no, impossible. She was far too dull for that. You know, very Jamie, Jamie kind of insults. The inn's common room, room had all the unu- uh, had all the usual sounds, the scrapes of spoons, the clinks of cups, the mutter of men, alliterations here. Um, a dozen patrons ate and drank at the tables while half as many warmed themselves at the hearth. One of them sawed the goodness of the father on a fiddle, his clumsiness with the instrument, uh, for everyone else to endure. Perhaps he's a famed bard in disguise, humbling himself with his bow in his offhand. The thought was absurd, Jimmy knew, but no more absurd than he was. His idea, like we, you know, uh, Bale the Bard is in disguise. Everything's Everybody's in disguise in the story. So Jimmy has this absurd thought that maybe the, 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 it's a bard in disguise and, and his bow is in his offhand and he's, he's making a go at it. And which is, what Jamie is like Jamie's in disguise using his offhand like he's this famed fighter the best in the world and but he's in disguise and using his using the wrong hand so he, Jamie kind of makes the same sort of like joke about this this horrible fiddler um goodness of the father this cuz cuz he's a he's a poor fellow there was little room to sit so they joined some men on a crowded bench next to me Brienne said a man with a crystal around his neck. In his own right, another man was reading from the Book of Holy Prayer. Didn't want it to be the, the, the seven-pointed star. That'd be too obvious, so we switch it to the other book. Um, and then there are the badges, the seven-pointed star, especially considering seven-pointed stars right there. Uh, seven-pointed star, red and white, stitched st- 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 to the breast of every cloak. And then Jamie has this little joke. Sparrows again. I must be made of breadcrumbs. This part of the flock called them, uh, was to call, liked to call themselves the poor fellows. Uh, poor fellows, but they all flew the same way, didn't they? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we wanted Jamie to run into people um, that are going to affect the story later on. And so this was, again, kind of fortunate in that, you know, I'd really thought we were done with the beginning of the story. And in the beginning of the story, uh, you know, in the Elaine chapter, we find out that... Um, Bonifer Hasty declares for Aegon. And so there's kind of a, okay, but he's only has a hundred. It's like, will that, will that do anything? But here we're finding out that, oh, wait, actually the poor fellows um, have, are getting control over the Riverland, Riverlands. So when Bonifer Hasty um, declares for Aegon, it means something. And so a lot of the, this is the reason why the poor fellows are here. Um, in order to try to, you know, give, give, make Bonifer Hasty's declaration for Aegon means something um so from the uh, table's far end there's, there's from some foreign words caught Jamie's ear high Valyrian as a boy he never paid the maester's lessons much mind but he knew enough to place the girlish accent Tyrashi traitors now I think people know me well enough to know that this is like one of the dropped plots that I bring up all the time like in a game of thrones some Tyrashi traders went over to rob um and they're never mentioned again and one could say, okay, maybe Greenbeard in the Brotherhood 
was one of them, but what happened to all the rest of them? It was a whole sellsword company. So here we have them and them being Tairashi is going to come back later because they're going to introduce some, inf some information that uh, might come up in the next Samwell chapter uh, with regards to Volantis. Um, so Tarashi traders, uh, though they'd long run out of die for their beards, it was during the Battle of the Camps that the company had gone over, the, gone over to the Young Wolf. Um, after that, he'd assumed that they all died somewhere or, or fled home or turned brigand. A few had found the Seven Gods instead, it seemed. If he had a right hand, Jamie Lannister would have helped, helped them find the Seven Hells as well. So yeah, this idea is Jamie's Jamie's idea is Jamie's clever, you know, like Jamie's clever. He's he's throwing in jokes. Um, a fat boy appeared, sweat in his straw-like hair, and a tankard in each hand. Ale. Uh, in case you didn't catch it, this is Hot Pie. He's never given his name, but uh, this is Hot Pie, and Hot Pie has straw-like hair. When we last left him, he was working at the end of the cross, uh, the uh, the end of the kneeling man. So that's Hot Pie right there. And it's important that Hot Pie is here because if you, uh, if, I mean, you'll see that Hot Pie is spying on Jamie and Brienne throughout the chapter. Um, and so, because we, we, we find out Sharna's feelings, uh, but yes. Anyway, Bri a cup of cider for me, Brienne. She had ordered that the last time. That was true. She did order um, when Cleos comes in and says like, oh, there's great ale here. And then she goes and orders cider. Like it's, it's this thing that I thought was kind of funny. Like Cleos is like, oh, the ale here is supposed to be really good. I'll have some cider. <laughs> okay. So Jamie gets her on this and he's, he says, um, my dear cousin praised the ale here. Jamie said, remembering Cleos, uh, does your tongue have no curiosity? Brienne studied Jamie's smile. Ale is fine. So she agrees to have some ale. And so Hot Pie clumsily puts down the tankard, sloshing half the drinks onto the table. Jamie lifts his for a toast to our missing third. Um, more because he, he's pretending to be sentimental here. May my late cousin's memory loosen your lips or may the drink. Cuz is, you know, this Feast for Crows term that comes in that Jamie uses a bit because he meets a lot of his cousins in the Feast for Crows. So he uses cuz. He was a good man. Uh, and, you know, Cleos Frey was a good man. There's nothing wrong with Cleos Frey, but Jamie doesn't really like him too much. So he's like, for fawning and groveling, few better. I pray his ghost finds rest. He drank deep, uh, hoping she would match him. And so, you know, I'm bringing, you know, bringing back Cleos because, you know, Cleos, everybody needs some Cleos Frey references, right? Uh, instead, she only looked troubled. And this is some, this is uh, stuff that I thought was really great. Um, we never buried him. The dead should be buried. And of course, we're going to bring this buried. There's a couple of meanings to this. One, Lady Stoneheart was never buried. Um, they tossed Catalan's body in the river and it washes up. And there we have our problem. You know, had the phrase buried her, we wouldn't we wouldn't be in this situation. But um, the, we also, of course, this idea of that. Um, people's issues you try to bury them deep inside you but they just they just can't be buried right uh and it's a little it, it's one of the things i thought about because it's how it's how um a bitter blooms george or martin's story bitter blooms begins where the the character is trying to is trying to bury a body and she can't because the the ground is is frozen <clears throat> And so Jamie then gets her and says, ah, I agree. Can I count on you to bury each and all of my pieces then when the time comes? You know, really pushing forward the fact that, like, I'm going to die if I have to battle somebody. That got to her for once. I, you hungry, interrupted Hot Pie. <laughs> I've made pies. I don't know, you know, should be obvious to people that Hot Pie made some pies. Inside is dot, 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 rabbit. Here's our cannibalism reference, um, you know. It's uh, all of these these cannibalism references are all over the place in Ice and Fire. Obviously, you know, Arya at the the House of Black and White, or Singer Stew, or the 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 Acorn Paste, which you know things like that. So, Jamie didn't give a fig what was in the pies. He was famished. Pie it is, then Baker Boy, and tell the innkeep two rooms as well. You have a name. 
And then here comes Sharna. Sharna the innkeeper, though, she, again, she's never given a name. Ah, he does, but it's none of your business. An ill-favored woman stepped up to the table with a kettle and ladle. She moved on the bench, refilling bowls for the poor fellows. What should we holler when we're thirsty? And we will be thirsty. Um, there's a lot of, you know, trying to make every line that Jamie says, like, interesting. Because Jamie's an interesting guy. He answers to boy, which was the other, the previous. So before it was Sharna, husband, and boy. But so now hot pie is the new boy. Um, so he answers to boy, and that's good enough for you, to you. I had two boys, but one drowned. So previous boy died. Won't be in confusion. The others take the floods. Um, the others take being, of course, the swear. The floods. People don't talk about the floods very much, but... If you remember, at the end of A Storm of Swords, there was huge flooding in the Riverlands. Um, Arya deals with it a little bit. But, you know, if you think of, like, they actually, it's actually only been, you know, a handful of months, six months or something since those floods. Um, so, you know, in a sense, she's, she, you know, they're, they're recent. They're rebuilding from that. And these, these uh, it's very clear that the, the faith of the seven and the poor fellows have inserted themselves. Um, the goodwill of that they they showed in the Riverlands has uh, won over at least Sharna. This used to be the goodwill that the Brotherhood without banners was taking advantage of, but the Brotherhood has changed, you know. So um, the floods killed the innkeeper. Wasn't an innkeeper too? It seemed, and in fact. Um, we needed the floods to kill the innkeeper who wasn't an innkeeper because husband is the one that met Jamie and Brienne before. He couldn't be in the story because he would recognize them. Sharna and Hot Pie have never met them, but but husband did. So husband needed to die. <laughs> so the floods killed husband. And so he says, ah, oh, a uh, woman running an inn by herself must be dangerous. By myself, I have a dozen husbands here. She gestured with her ladle to the stars along the bench. Star is uh, another term for poor fellow. They protect me well enough. Ah, oh, husbands. The woman's just sent him to wondering about his own life. What it might have been like if he'd been made protector of a woman, not a king. Um, you know, keep in mind that Jimmy's a little bit traditional. Uh, Lysa Lannister would have been her name. She'd always wanted a strong son, and he would have given her that. Not like that doomed little errand boy. And she fancied him well enough. Her glances at court had hardly been subtle. And this is part of the the whole thing, how I, I feel like a lot of the characters don't talk about each other, even though they lived at court for years. So Lysa, Lysa Aaron is is there with Jamie for years. So we want to, you know, so they have, must have some relationship. And so the idea is that, you know, she, she thought Jamie was hot and would stare at him every once in a while. Um, which, if, or at least Jamie is deluded in thinking this. Which you've ever grown to that fat and frightened woman at the rock. And that's the fat and frightened is what Jamie calls her in a Game of Thrones. Um, but if he had been by her side keeping her safe, would she be fat and, fr uh, fat and um, frightened? It was a pointless question. The past was ash. Um, yeah, I, I came up with this line. Uh, I think in A Clash of Kings, Crescent tells Stannis to focus on the future and he says the past is dust and i was like that's that's uh because originally this line was the past was past but then i was like yeah, let's make it a little more poetic the past is dust but then he'd just be saying but then i was like ah oh, the past is ash that's even more uh it's even more devastating than the past is dust you know that things all fell apart like when in, in ash they actively burned and fell apart versus dust like they just through through time they falls apart this is that this is the more that the that his his history is a tragedy so his past is ash fool that he'd been he'd chosen cersei over a dozen maids um young uh fairer than young lysa and he does he does think that lysa's fair um young lysa was that he liked he actually liked her well done he answered that's six better than magor though i shudder at the thought of a a dozen good mothers. And this is just Jamie making jokes. He, of course, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny that like, had he married Cersei, the, the, he would have no good mother, right? Because <laughs> they have the same mother who's dead. Anyway, the poor fellow with the crystal grumbled. We don't take kindly to japes about Mary Rather Cruel. That's a little bit of, little bit of echoing um, 
uh, Tycho Nestorus, not liking japes about dragons. When he killed our brothers and he took our swords, he left our re the realm to fall into wantonness and sin. And these, these are just, you know, they're zealots. So Jamie's like, ugh, that didn't take long. The pious were always keen to lecture. The least among them lost no chance to play the septum. But Jamie's a complete dickhead here because he's getting drunk. Jamie grimaced and finished his tankard. Or he's just like, I'm going to die, so whatever. And this is this is where the, the benefit of the Tairashi comes in. I thought Megor only had the one wife, the tiger girl. So, of course, there's a tiger faction in Volantis. Um, and this is going to come up when we do the Sam chapter, because we're going to get into uh, Volantis a bit. The Table of Stars looked up and on plus we, th plus we speak of the old king you dolt. And so here we <laughs> get a little background. So a lot of fans do wonder what happened to uh, Arian Brightflame's child. Like he, sh he was a child um, around the time of the Great Council. So he should be like well alive, like, you know, uh, 50s or 60s by the time of Robert's Rebellion, you know. And so this idea is like what happened to him? So... This is this idea that well, let's let's give him a little background here. So, let's let's like you know, he confuses Megor the Cruel with Megor the Sunbird, and uh, Sunbird just came just came to came to me. The, the The idea is that you know you don't want it to be just Bright Flame or something. People people don't really take the previous nicknames; they they get their own, you know. So. Um, in truth, there wasn't much to say after the Great Council that craned egg on the unlikely. The other claimants disappeared for fear they would share the same fate as Amy's Blackfire. This is a just a good explanation on why they aren't around. They all fled. Jamie only knew of the Sunbird because of Ares. Near the end, he had demanded an emissary be sent to Volantis to recruit an ally against Robert. Varys had had to remind him that Magar Targaryen was a decade dead. But, you know, obviously, what was he doing? What family? Where? Who is he living with? Who did he marry? Does he have children? This is all going to be explored when we get to when we get to Sam. These are dark times, but we clutch our blades again, pure of heart. Interrupted an older man with a star carved into his cheek. The 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 the, the, the sparrows carve um, stars into their body. Soon the realm will atone for its sins. You'll see. Jamie belched. Oh, the world is not so bad, is it? Fervor was best when it was silence. The Mad King had taught him that the ale had made him bold. I mean, that's all true, probably. Uh, winter is nigh. It's true, but the war is over. River and surrendered. Blackwood and Bracken have ended their quarrel at last. He could take pride in that. They, what he accomplished there, perhaps the last good thing he'd ever do. Golden Hand the Peacemaker. So <laughs> he's still clinging to this idea of his memory as Golden Hand. And he says, ah, I care not for the squabbles over which boy wears the crown. Um, this is kind of a, a, a joke to this old man because to, to him, everybody's a boy. So it's like, whether it be Renly or Rob Stark or Joffrey or or uh, or Tommen, but it's also kind of a, a little joke because Aegon gets in there too because um, even though he probably doesn't know about Aegon. Before the comet, perhaps, but now, now the world's different. So a little little shout out for the comet. The days grow short and the forest are full of, full of demons, those of fire and those of ice. So we get our ice and fire reference here. And that piques, piques Jamie's interest. This is a new sermon, ice demons. Are they the grumpkins who bring the winter? So he's mocking them too. He means the wolves, said Hot Pie, returning with their pies and a fresh tankard. This again, I had quite enough of this direwolf in their infernal pack. This is, uh, I, admittedly, this is a bit repetitive because they kind of make these same comments again, two or four in this pack, but um, nonetheless. Was the poor fellow talking about some other wolf? How many legs do these wolves run? Think of the car Starks, two or four. It makes no matter. The Northmen are wargs. And this is the idea, that, so we're, now we're, getting these the stories that kind of conflate some of the the magic that we have seen in in the uh, in the story um so they worship trees and drink the blood of children to gain wicked powers well you know that's kind of true 
about the 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 skin changers, right? They do kind of they do worship trees, and the trees drink blood, and Bran dr- drinks that acorn paste, you know. So it th- he's not a hundred percent wrong. <laughs> He says, then he says, beneath a cold moon, their hair grows long and ragged. They drop to all fours and their teeth, oh, razor sharp. And keep in mind that people, people accused Rob Stark of being, a, being a, essentially a werewolf. I mean, they talk about wargs changing in. But, he, but this idea of like, <laughs> they, they accuse Rob of being a werewolf because people saw the hound going around killing people at the Red Wedding. And so they assumed that that was Rob Stark. Um. And so the hound is out there or a person with the hound hound's head. But here, here again, he's talking about the werewolves. It's a razor shop of mauve icicles and hoarfrost and death, which is kind of a reference to Bran when he goes to the, <laughs> the door and it's inside as icicles and hoarfrost and death. Um, but yes. Drunk on the gods and armed with blades, a perilous marriage. It was all Cersei's fault. This was, and it's true, Aunt Jenna, <clears throat> he remembered that his Aunt Jenna had warned him of, of this. Yes, Aunt Jenna does say that this is a really bad idea, that she has armed the, the faith militant. She was a wise woman that his father had admitted. Perhaps Cersei would call her court if I, and there's a bit of introduction, the idea that I, I do plan on bringing Jenna to court as regent. I think that's so, I'm just kind of um, seeding this idea here too. And he's like, oh, I'll never see a sweet sister again. What of these fiery ones? The Brotherhood, said Brienne, outlaws. Now, there's some discussion about, like, how often is the Brotherhood called the Brotherhood? They call themselves the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood of the the Hollow Hill. But, you know, it's it's not brought up too much. I want to say, I mean, in the appendices and such, but... Um, but the Brotherhood Without Banners may never be called oh, are they called I think they might be called Brotherhood once by, by Brienne um, certainly they call themselves the Brotherhood Without Banners to Arya but then like does the rest of the world call them the Brotherhood or do they just call themselves that and I think Yes, Brienne Five does hear that Lord Randall is putting Lord Randall is putting it about that uh, they did in hopes of turning the Commons against Beric and his Brotherhood. So there is some, there is one mention, and then and that's it. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's. it's they're called Brotherhood at least once. <laughs> so, I mean, outside of themselves. Um, and so he says, oh, no, they're not outlaws. They're an order of sorcerers, red priests, necromancers. And so here we get this um, with swords of flame. That's all true. The red priests have swords of flame. They can cast terror and sin. This idea of casting a shadow, casting terror and sin. So it gets into like the shadow babies and stuff. Their shadows flicker and dance in the night stealing babies for their ritual but now we're getting into like oh are they the others and then their sacrifices can raise the dead and it's true that they can raise the dead (laughs) and but uh you know and the babies are stolen by the others they raise the dead too so we're getting you know this conflation of all these stories brianne's face darkened she quaffed her tankard because she knows about the raising of the dead since when did these such stories frighten the warrior maid it was nonsense you only speak of Thoros of Mir, yes? asked Jamie. I saw him at a tourney once. He looked more soft than sorcerer to me, and his only spell was making his breakfast reappear after a melee. Of course, Jamie, Jamie has to pretend like he's he wasn't in that that uh, that melee and uh, that tourney, you know. But anyway, that that's his spell. His fantastic spell is puking because he's drunk. Seasons change, and so do men. The red ones are a vicious lot. The greedy, a greedy lot. The kick broke in. The Lord and the Lady, King's Men and Queen's Men. There's a lot to unpack in these. You know, you can read into what you what you uh, what you like, but you know, obviously, this is the Lightning Lord and Lady Stoneheart, or the Lord and the Lady, or Lord Dondarrion and Lady Catelyn. King's Men and Queen's Men. Um, and yeah, we don't know the who the Brotherhood actually follows if they follow anyone. 
is, I mean, they kind of said they're Kingsmen because of, of Robert, but does that make sense? But they're kind of also known for not having any um, moral backbone. So it's like, who do they really follow? And then the Queen's men, this idea of who is the Queen in this situation? Um, and uh, what is, you know, is Lady Stoneheart the Queen? Um, it has to do with, you know, maybe Rob's will and things like this. They come sniffing around, demanding a toll for protection, each higher than the last. I tell them, put those strapping arms to work. Fish a stream, raise a barn, dig a well. But no, they'd rather burn their knife fires and rob the farmers and do God's know what else. Well, let the hang woman hang me and the lightning lord strike me down. I, I, I quite liked this line. Um, the hang, you know, the, that's one of her nicknames is the hang woman. So she's like, let the hang woman hang me and the lightning lord is Barak. Let him strike me down. To hell with them both. They weren't here when the waters rose. My sparrows were. Seven saved them. So so then Jamie says, oh, there's a rift between Stoneheart and Dardarian, is there? That was good. Perhaps the rivals would kill each other off, just as Aegon and Rhaenyra had. He'd hate to leave a job undone. Jamie emptied his tankard and looked for boy. He was behind him already with another drink. That's sneaky hot pie. Sneaky hot pie. Lord Bonifer the Good will rout the evil out. Said the young sparrow to his right, closing his book. The new warden of the rivers, God be praised. Uh, people really got on me for for inventing this title, warden of the rivers. There's no warden of the rivers, um, and they and the joke is kind of that they dro- like George R. R. Martin kind of dropped the whole warden plot, um, and so it's just kind of throwing it in. But yeah, he's not a lo- Bonifer isn't a lord either, so this is the whole thing. He's they're inventing titles for him. And Jamie stresses this. Do their fantasies have no end? Or is Hasty inventing titles for himself now? Yes. Um, Jamie flexes fingers on his missing hand. There's our, there's our uh, uh, John Kahn and, and John, John Snow references. <laughs> the small folk were quick to call any man a horse a lord. But to name a man warden was an honor too far. Sir Bonifer is no lord but a castellan, as I recall. And he has no army save his holy hundred. A hundred would be enough. His sword's blessed by the smith, proclaimed the bald one, and the warrior is adding strength to his arm besides. I hear he's giving out land for oaths of service. This is true. When we last saw Bonifer, he was giving out tracts of land for people that would join him. I mean to stand with him in the war to come. Where else can him? <laughs> so the thing is, is like he's handing out land for people to support him, and, and his lands are huge. But and then we have this little joke here. There's a callback to... to do you know what honor is? And he says, a horse. Jamie thinks a horse. So here he says, here he says where can a man find glory? In the stables. Um, so that's the, that's the joke there. It was Peter Baelish who had been granted Harrenhal along with all the lands and incomes. And those lands were vast, tens of thousands of acres stretching from the Trident to Harrentown, farther south still along the shores of the God's Eye. But Littlefinger wasn't there, and Cersei named Sir Bonifer Castle in his absence. With winter soon upon them, the lands would lie fallow for the nonce, but the promise of spring's bounty would, was as good as golden hand. If Hasty gave each man five acres, he could raise a sizable army. Let us hope Sir Bonifer the Good stays good and loyal. And in, the, in the, the next chapter, we find out that he doesn't stay good and loyal. He declares for Aegon. So this it was, it was fortunate that we have this chapter to just add more to add more to, to Bonifer. The old sparrow looked over at Brienne curiously as if seeing her armor for the, for the first time. The lady begging her pardon, but the, in the seven-pointed star it is written, the father smiles upon a daughter with a babe at her breast. No babe can nurse through a breastplate. Um, so I didn't think of it at the time, but I suppose this does have the whole like useless as nipples on a breastplate kind of thing, um, like element to it. But yeah. Jamie sniggered as Brienne took a sip of ale, no doubt buying a moment to compose herself. Then she looked the old star in the eye. And here we get the... <clears throat> this is this is a very, very important um, line here on the theme of the Jamie and Brienne story and what George R. Martin believes. Um more or less, or at least, you know, according to his writing, what I think he believes. Um, I mean, this matches, for the most part, like what is in Sand Kings, that, that religion lays a good foundation. But then after that, it's up for, man, for men to, 
decide uh, for what they what they will do with their lives, you know, on their own. And it's kind of what George did, right? George started out religious and then and then stopped being religious. So he had he in his personal life he had a he had a religious basis and then and then chose to go on and and live without God. And he kind of, Sand Kings is a story about society like f- at first embracing religion but then growing beyond religion and moving beyond you know so Brienne's statement here is everything okay this is this is kind of everything and it has to do with like what's going to happen when Brienne Brienne and Jamie face Stoneheart and all these things things about like morality where do you get your morality from where does it derive from you can derive it from religion you can derive it from someone else or you can choose you can choose for yourself what it is all right so my septon told me that the father is like all fathers teaching us guide, giving us guidance showing his children the way but no doubt a father is proud when his children can finally stand on their own and find their own way in the world so this is the whole thing right um bran is decide, decides what is right on her own that is the idea And if there were a higher power, the higher power would be proud of his creations becoming mature enough to make those decisions on their own and not needing to be, to be told, to be told what to do. That's, um, and I kind of fundamentally think that that's, that's what George would, that's what George would believe. So, and I think that this is the, the, the theme of the Jamie and Brienne story. But the old man comes back. The old man shook his head. Your septon told you wrong. Men and women are only truly grown when they fully when they submit fully to the will of the father. You should tell your septon that. I'll be sure to I'll be sure to when I see him. Brienne gave the old fool a smile. It was only a little smile, no more than politeness demanded, but it was a smile nonetheless. She had never smiled for Jamie. Not that he could rem- not that he could remember. That's true. That's true. She has never smiled for him. Um, how far are we here? It's because I'm going to break this up. Is this about just checking my word count here? Yeah, I'm about, I'm a little more than halfway. So, um, let's take a break here and we'll come back to this later. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.